Uh, all right, so um, good morning, afternoon, or even evening, everybody. Um, I am um, uh, together with Ashley Barker. Uh, I'm Osni Marquez. We'll be hosting this webinar today. This webinar is brought to you by the uh, computing facilities under the Department of Energy, U.S. Department of Energy Office of Science, the uh, facilities at Argonne, Oak Ridge, and Berkeley National Laboratories. Today's speaker is Neil True Hong. Uh, who is with the Software Sustainability Institute in, in the United Kingdom, in, in Scotland, actually, the University of Edinburgh. So uh, he has been, uh, he is the editor of a number of publications, for example, the Open Research Software. He's also the Advisory Council Chair of the Software Carpentry Foundation. Is the Chair of the Engineering and the Physical Sciences Research Council in the United Kingdom. Uh, he uh, plays a role there in the strateg strategic advisory team for uh, e uh, infrastructure. His uh, research uh, interests include barriers and incentives in research software ecosystems and the role of software as a research object. With that, Neil, please thank you for uh, 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 doing this for us. And you take this stand, please. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, uh, Osni and uh, Ashley, for inviting me along. Um, can uh, can I just do a quick check with you, Osni, that I'm sharing my slides now? Yes, you are. Excellent. Okay, um, and thank you very much, everyone, for uh, attending this webinar. Um, hopefully, I will uh, be saying some things that you find interesting or useful, and uh, if not, please do ask me questions. So, um, as Osni said, uh, my name is Neil Chuhong from the Software Sustainability Institute in the United Kingdom, and we are a, a cross-university collaboration um, of the universities of Edinburgh, Manchester, Oxford, and Southampton, uh, which has been working since 2010 to understand uh, how researchers use and develop software and how to improve the practice of using and developing scientific software and research software. So this talk is going to be about different lessons we've learned um, from across different disciplines. Because one of the things that's quite unusual about us as an institute is that we uh, work across many different sectors. So we have funding from uh, pe uh, people in the engineering physical sciences, um, the social sciences, the biological sciences, uh, but we also work in the arts and humanities, um, in the environmental sciences and geosciences, uh, and uh, basically across the entire uh, scientific and research domains. But I think one thing that I always introduce these kinds of talks with is this slide, um, which is from the XKCD cartoon, which I'm sure a number of you probably read on a regular basis, uh, because I think Randall Monroe really gets across some of the real challenges we have around research software. And one of them is simply that best practice is hard. So it's not easy to understand how to produce good software. Um, we're often up against a lot of constraints because uh, either we have insufficient resources, not enough time, not enough experience. Uh, typically one size doesn't fit all, so something that might work very well for one piece of software or one software project doesn't work for another. And in almost all cases, if you want to have best practice that is tractable and sustainable, it requires more than just one person buying into it to become widely adopted. So it's something where you really need to go and communicate what you're seeking to do for that best practice to become adopted. And this is what the Software Sustainability Institute was set up to do. Um, in the UK, we're this national facility for cultivating better, more sustainable research software to enable world-class research. Uh, and really what that means um, is that we do a number of different things to help the community understand how it uses software, how it develops software, and how it can be done better. Um, so some of that is directly working with people uh, and different research groups, so working to improve specific pieces of software, be it in um, plant science or nuclear fusion um, or um, biochemistry, delivering training, so trying to work out 
how we ensure that everyone's skills are improved, um, bringing together people through different community initiatives, including things like events and our fellowship program, so that we can understand what are the current and topical issues, and collecting evidence to help our stakeholders and other stakeholders define policy and guidance and understand why this is so important. So all of this work feeds into the presentation that uh, I'm going to give you. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about is, first of all, the fact that software is ubiquitous and diverse. So going into um, all of the different ways in which software is a part of research today. What some of the consequences of um, software that might not be as good as we want it could be. Uh, delving into the issues around whether this is a technical problem or actually a cultural problem. And then going on to um, coming up with some of the things we've learned around adoption of best practice at different scales, which really leads down to that message I was giving on the second slide, which is that it's impossible to do this on your own. So what we're trying to understand is how do we more easily develop software and make it sustainable um, across groups and collaborations. Um, because I think the thing that I always say to people is that no one intentionally writes unsustainable software. Uh, we don't go out and start off writing something to be unsustainable. Now, some people might say that we do write things that have a very short, um, a short life. So we might be writing a script that's used only once, but it's not unsustainable in some sense because what we're doing here is writing something that has functionality for the time that is necessary. And that's one thing that it often is a challenge, um, is understanding what the definition of software sustainability is. Um, so Dan Katz has come up with one definition, which is around um, software being available in the future, uh, available on new platforms, meeting new needs. So the idea that it evolves through time to meet the current needs and the new needs of the researchers that use it. Um, Patricia Lego uh, has a similar but slightly different um, definition, which is around software fulfilling its intent over time. So it basically uh, does what it should do. And I think that's one of the real challenges with research software is this tension between fulfilling the author's purpose and fulfilling others' um, potential needs. So you may write a piece of software for yourself, um, and then share it with your collaborators, they share it with their collaborators, and quickly you're not just developing the software to fill your purpose and your needs, but other people's needs. And therefore sustainability becomes harder because uh, perhaps you do not have enough resources to do this, or it's taking it in a different direction from one you're interested in. And so this is really where we're trying to, to uh, go with software sustainability, is understanding how to uh, balance these different tensions. So the first sort of thing I was going to talk about is around the use of software in research and how widespread this is. In the UK we did a survey across uh, the research intensive universities talking to researchers and asking them um, whether they use software in their research and how important it was. And I think the thing that we identified was not only was software use near ubiquitous, which we expected, um, but just how many people felt it was fundamental to their results. So in this case, 69% um, felt that they could not do their research without the use of specialist software. And the other thing that was surprising was how many people were developing their own software, whether that was um, creating new programs or extending existing programs and scripts. So over half of the researchers were developing their own software in some way. And this has been backed up by other surveys that have been done since then. Uh, a similar survey in the US of um, postgraduates came up with very similar results. Uh, and we're now seeing surveys from across the world showing a, a very sort of similar kind of uh, usage and importance uh, of software to research. We can look at it in different ways. Uh, we've been looking at ePrints repositories, which are basically a digital repository that are used widely in the UK for storing preprints. And what you can see here is that the number of 
preprints that are being deposited in institutional digital repositories, which mention some form of software um, or use of software, has been increasing dramatically over the last decade. Uh, likewise, if you look at um, uh, the occurrences of software being mentioned in journals, things like Nature, uh, there was a very good study by Nangi and Katz that just looked at the, the different mentions of software over a three-month period uh, in the Nature journal. And what you can see here again is that uh, not only is there a huge number of pieces of software that have been mentioned, I think um, if I remember rightly, on average, it was it was over five pieces of software in each paper, but that there's a huge diversity of software that's in use. Um, we did similar surveys uh, looking at um, what software people use in their research, and I think the thing that shocked us was finding out just how long a tail of software there is. So whilst there were a few packages that were very popular, things like Python, MATLAB, R, and other um, programming languages, along with things like SPSS and Excel, which were widely used for data analysis. Uh, after that, the number of packages that were effectively being used by a single respondent was huge. And that makes sustaining the software really hard, because what's happening is that each person's research workflow is effectively unique. So, so the use of software is, is ubiquitous, fundamental, and diverse. Um, and I think the key take home here is that software is important, but it's often overlooked as something as, uh, that's part of the researcher ecosystem. So um, I'll just check, are there any questions at uh, this stage? Neil, I don't see questions, but for the participants uh, uh, in, the, in the chat, uh, I think Dan Katz made some comments there and uh, he gave a point about the survey that you just mentioned. Okay, I can't see the chat window, unfortunately. No, that, uh, that's fine. So pl pl yeah, please continue then. <laughs> okay. um, it, yeah, sorry, uh, sorry to Dan there. Um, and uh, yes, please, please feel free to, to couch these as questions, which I'll take uh, during this uh, webinar. Okay, so um, moving on, uh, one of the issues here is that if software is ubiquitous um, and important but overlooked, the consequences of incorrect software can be really quite large. Um, one example here of a piece of software which is probably the uh, most popular modeling and simulation tool and database used in research today, uh, which is Excel, uh, came up in a paper um, that has been widely used in terms of setting governmental policy. So a paper called Growth in a Time of Debt by um, two economists called Reinhardt and Rogoff. Uh, and the problem here, which you may or may not be able to see on the slide, is that they've effectively summed over the wrong set of rows. So their, their summation um, doesn't quite go all the way down the column. And it's a minor mistake, uh, but it's one that shows how easy it is uh, to have a small mistake creep into um, something, uh, a piece of software that's being used for analysis that can go on to have quite a large effect. Um, and if you want to find out more about that, there's uh, a number of different articles linked off of this slide which go into this into more detail and ask the question of whether it's actually the software that is the problem or the processes around how you might review uh, research and how much it depends on software. Um, but that's something which is um, in economics and using Excel, and you might think, okay, uh, this would not happen if we were using um, a programming language and um, programs that have been written using some sort of software engineering process. So uh, again, the, the challenge here is that that's not necessarily true. Here's another example here where we have um, a paper that was published um, in bioinformatics and um, uh, around basically population migration where there was a large amount of research done based on a new technique for extracting DNA samples from very old uh, human remains. Uh, and there's a lot of really good work here, and it uh, led to a very large consortium of uh, people doing a number of different steps in the workflow. They eventually ended up with this paper uh, published in Science, which suggested that not only had humans 
moved from um, Africa into Europe, but also that at some later date, uh, a substantial proportion had moved back from Europe into Africa. Of course, this was something that was very much um, at odds with all of the other research that had been carried out in the field. Um, and as it turned out, it was wrong because what had happened was that at one point in the bioinformatics pipeline, uh, something had been binned, some results had been um, seen as being out of range, and instead of being flagged so that they could be checked, they were simply discarded, leading to things later on in that workflow uh, coming up with the wrong results. And again, um, why, do I, why do I kind of uh, introduce this sort of example? I think one is to show that it happens in all the different, uh, different spheres of uh, research, and also the, the challenges. So the lead author on this paper is a PhD student. And if there's one thing you don't want to have to do as a PhD student is retract um, a paper that is published in a top journal. So it's, it's one of these challenges. The good part of this particular example is that because a lot of this was done openly and the authors published their data and their scripts, that people were able to go and find exactly where the mistake was and alert the authors to this. So I think this is actually an example of where open science can help, um, can help address some of the issues we might have around the difficulties of writing good software and checking it for errors. And we see this in, in, in other areas. Uh, I'm not going to go into this example but, uh, uh, in any detail, but again, what we have here is um, an example of where there's a lot of promising science where because of a small error in um, the software leads the entirety of that research output to be called into question. So I think um, one of the challenges is that when we have mistakes in software, what they do is erode the trust in research and in researchers. And that might mean that researchers are less willing to share code, to make it available, or indeed to publish it um, as part of their outputs. Any questions? Uh, not at the moment. Okay. So, so here, here's the question then. If the problem is really around um, sharing and making people more aware of the fact that software is so fundamental and also actually quite hard to maintain, um, is the problem a cultural one? Uh, so we know that sharing is the key to reproducibility. There's been a lot of um, research done that looks at how it improves transparency, it helps eliminate errors, um, it encourages collaboration, um, it helps bring people on board and improves trust. And yet we still don't do it very often. Um, we, we have problems, uh, and I'll admit to it myself, of, of knowing when the right time is to share, um, making things available um, earlier in the cycle, uh, and this, this afflicts a lot of different areas. So we might expect, for instance, that in computer science there's a greater culture of sharing because it's somewhere where reproducibility has uh, become very important, uh, but as studies have shown, Many places don't really uh, make their, you know, many researchers don't make their code available. Um, uh, so in this survey of computer science journals that published by ACM, uh, very few provided a link to software, just as a matter of course. Likewise, uh, more generally, we're back to this journal of science. Uh, we can look and see how um, software is being shared. And interestingly for science, one of the things that's happened um, quite recently um, in 2011 is that they changed their editorial policies that say that they require all computer code to be deposited in a publicly accessible repository upon publication. Once, so basically once an author has been accepted, they're agreeing to make their code available. So here's an example of something that can be tested. Um, and Victoria Stodden and her team did exactly that. They uh, went back to the authors and asked them, could we see your code? Um, and I think what's, what's interesting here is for something which is a mandated policy, a lot of people didn't necessarily seem to be aware of it. Uh, so whilst there were 
um, a, a reasonable uh, percentage, 36% who shared their data in code. Uh, there were quite a few who said it was either impossible to share or pushed back on it. Um, and one of the reasons why I think this is a cultural problem um, can be seen in some of the responses they got. So um, as Stodden said, um, there appeared to be some confusion among authors uh, who appeared to be unaware of science's data and code share requirement. Uh, and they published some of the author responses that highlighted the barriers. Um, so uh, one example at the top here is uh, the kind of fear of um, fear of not being credited. So uh, we will only give you the, the code if you publish your findings while pr properly referring to us. So that kind of fear of, of, of not knowing what's happening to your research. Um, there's also this um, challenge where what you have is people not being confident in their code. So, so the second one is saying basically the code is not very user friendly, so I prefer not to share this code. And then there's the last two, which are really um, pointing at something which is much more uh, nasty that goes on within research, uh, which is basically saying, why should you have any rights to my research or code? Um, so can you explain yourself? Why are you asking me for my, my code? And I think this is really, really interesting because it goes against what we sort of see as being research, which is about building on other people's work. So how can you build on other people's work if you can't see their software? Um, another question around culture is the perceived importance of software. So maybe it's something that we're just not encouraged to do enough on. So it's often seen as something which um, we are asked to spend as little time on as possible, um, that we're not expected to test, let alone document. And I think this is one of the things that in the workshops we run, we come across again and again, is that people are talking to their supervisors or research group leaders, and the message they're getting back is that it's not important to make sure the software is good because it's only important to get the next paper. And the challenge here now is, given that what we know about reproducibility and the consequences of having um, poor software is that this is risking the research. So um, perhaps spending a little bit more time on the software will improve the research itself. Um, I'm going to skip over this slide, uh, which sort of saying the same sort of thing around the challenges around data and code sharing. Um, and then the last thing that is a real challenge is around um, reputation. So if, um, if science is all about reputation, the biggest barrier to a lot of particularly early career researchers sharing their code is the fear that someone will look at it, um, particularly someone more senior, and then um, essentially criticize it. And I think this is going particularly against what we are hoping to do with software sustainability, which is making sure that people um, make their code available, not so that it can be criticized, but so that other people can help them advance and improve and uh, essentially ensure that all researchers are doing things better. And if we're still in a culture where effectively what we risk in doing, um, in making our work available is our reputation, and if reputation is still the main thing that it gives you credit in research, then why would people share their code? So I think one of the biggest challenges around this being a cultural problem is that we need to educate our peers. We often think that it's, it's a problem with funders or an issue with um, publishers or journals, but actually the biggest barrier to better, more sustainable and maintainable um, software is our peers not understanding why this is important. Okay, any questions at this point? I don't see any. I was just left with the last uh, uh, slide, but yeah, but please go ahead. Okay, um, hopefully I haven't depressed people too much. Um, so, if, uh, so, so the challenge is educating our peers, and, and actually one of the things that's really great, um, and this is where the, the, the talk goes to from its lowest point 
back up into um, the sunshine um, is that actually there's been a lot of work that's been done um, to start addressing this. Uh, one example, um, so yeah, how, how can we um, get adoption of best practice at scale? So one example um, that came out of um, work that had been done as part of the software carpentry community, which I'm part of, is this paper called Best Practices for Scientific Computing, um, which basically tried to distill everything that we knew to be true around doing research software better. Um, and there are some great recommendations in there around um, things like um, incremental changes, um, being modular, all of the things that have had studies done on them that show that it works. Um, and so I highly recommend to people um, like your, uh, the audience on this webinar to read this paper if you haven't and um, see if there's anything there that surprised you. I think it won't. The biggest challenge with this paper was when um, it was published, whilst a lot of people felt that it was a really important um, thing to put out there, it, it's actually the case that most researchers aren't at a stage or have the support or infrastructure that allow them to uh, implement even a few of these recommendations and best practices. And another problem here is, again, if you're trying to encourage people to try and do their best or provide you know, best effort, um, one of the things you don't want to do is put them off because they are trying to do something which seems unattainable. So a second paper was produced um, called Good Enough Practices in Scientific Computing. And this is the one I encourage you to share with everyone you collaborate with. Um, and what it does is strip this back to the bare minimum that will improve people's practice. And so um, it really goes back to um, things like saving your data. Um, uh, when it talks about version control, normally we would think about things like version control systems um, and using uh, Git properly. Whereas this is really talking about making sure you, you name files differently so that you understand which um, piece of software you use to generate which result. So it's really stripping it back to the basics. But the point is that this is something that people can build on. And that's what's really, um, really kind of like gives you the, the hope and um, the, uh, the kind of joy part of it is that people really do want to do this. Uh, and so in particular, um, one of the big success stories of recent years has been the carpentries, both software carpentry, data carpentry, and uh, their other kind of sibling programs that are now um, coming up that are targeted at things like librarians and social scientists. Um, and one of the things that uh, the carpentries try and do is make learning easy for people to access and make learning um, easy for people to, uh, to to use in their standard practice. So here, what these are are foundational courses for researchers teaching them just enough to get by and providing them with enough information so that they can go on and continue on their learning path. Um, and these have, these have now been run all over the globe, um, including in Antarctica, so can probably claim to be one of the few uh, coding and uh, data analysis skills um, training that has run on every, uh, every one of the seven continents. And the wonderful thing about this is that it's a community of uh, people who are doing this. This is, this is something which has very much been about people coming in as learners and then wanting to give back and staying on as trainers and helpers and instructors. So this if you're interested in the carpentries and you haven't heard about it, um, I strongly urge you to, to um, ask me a question or get in touch with the carpentries by, um, by email or by one of the other many means and see if you can run a carpentries um, training course near you um, for the people at your organization. Um, another similar kind of community that has been attracting a lot of interest recently is something called the Research Software Engineering Community. Um, and here, a research software engineer is um, basically that, that position that is often called um, a research associate um, and often goes hidden in many research projects, 
where it is someone who is doing the software development um, uh, as part of a research project. So in these ideas that nowadays research are part of big collaborations and actually what you have is teams of people working each with different um, experiences and skill sets and expertise. Um, we've over the last few um, years always seen teams that have the software person but quite often those software people haven't been recognized. So uh, one of the things that the Software Sustainability Institute has done um, in uh, the last five or six years is look about getting recognition for these people, giving them a name, research software engineer, uh, and going about trying to advocate for why it is useful to have these people in your organization. And I think one of the really great things that's happened is that um, in the UK, funders have got on board and really what we're seeing now is that there is a recognition that having software expertise available to researchers is a good idea, not just um, because it will improve the software, but because it will improve the research and the standing of the university. So these RSCs these are people who want to work in a research environment, they want to advance research, and importantly, they want to develop software. Um, and what we're seeing now is that they are um, popping up all over the world. So we have um, research software engineer um, surveys in several different countries, including the USA, um, Canada, um, and places in Europe and Africa, just trying to find out more about the people who identify with, uh, with this term and also how um, we can support them and what their challenges are. And so I think what's, what's really interesting about this is this is a community of practice which is growing because people are interested in getting more recognition for the work they do. So um, going away from this idea of um, educating your peers, the other thing that people want to do is bond with their peers and share practice. Um, another way of sharing practice is through the publication of guidance. Um, on the Software Sustainability Institute's um, website, our guides are the most popular things that we produce. Uh, so we have um, thousands of people who are reading and using our guides. Um, and it's really, it's really interesting because it means that we are able to have an impact on um, people's work and people's careers without ever coming face to face with them. But on their own, one of the problems with guides is that they don't necessarily ensure adoption of good practice. They help nudge people along the way, but uh, you need additional things to help the practice to stick. And a good example of this is the work that's being done um, in uh, the German Aerospace Center, uh, DLR, by their software engineering group, um, which, comprise, uh, which is led by Karina Haupt and Tobias Slauch, uh, where they are really trying to do this at scale. So the German Aerospace Center um, has more than 8,000 employees and um, a fifth of them are involved in software development. So that's, that's 1,600 people doing research software development. Um, and they had a couple of goals, one of which was to improve the sustainability and quality of software products. And the other one was how to improve the software engineering skills um, of the uh, people who were developing software for DLR. Because I think one of the things they noted, which is also something which has come up in the surveys that have been run, is that many um, people who are developing research software, even in very large professional organizations, don't have formal training in software engineering. So how did they do this? Um, they set up uh, a software engineering initiative, um, which basically comprised five different things. Um, one is guidance, um, so I'm going to come back to that. Uh, but the other four things are really interesting. So one is around training, as expected, kind of providing courses, providing um, different types of resources and materials. But the other things they were doing are all around providing those linkages, particularly because DLR is um, something which is spread across many multiple sites. So one is around knowledge provision, which in this case is typically around things like uh, a wiki to share um, uh, different types of practice and process. It's around collaboration, bringing people together. 
Um, but importantly, it's around experience exchange. So it's around doing a number of different things from workshops, um, from online um, seminars and get togethers to away days um, that allow people to talk to each other, learn about who else in the organization is doing similar things and exchange experience with them. Um, and all of this goes together to help enforce uh, the guidance that they're providing. Um, and uh, one of the things that they've done uh, to make things easier is to create checklists. So they provide uh, checklists of good practice that can be applied at different types of levels. So I said that one size doesn't fit all. One of the things you can do is look at how you can split guidance to help address different um, kind of maturity levels. So perhaps uh, when software is in a research prototype or um, something that is being shared with others or in um, uh, production use. And uh, I realized that I haven't updated my slides because um, these, uh, uh, these guidelines have now been published um, the, just this week um, and both German and English uh, language versions of these are now available. And what I might do is update the version of slides I have up on Figshare to include that link and pass those links on to um, Osni to share out as well. Um, and I think this is one of the things that's really important is that we can we can have some general general guidance around software engineering, but it's really important to customize this guidance in association with the people who are working in that community to create something that everyone buys into and everyone is happy to follow because it's not something that's being imposed from above. It's something that's being created and defined from below uh, in a way that everyone um, feels that they um, are happy to put the effort in to do. And we've seen this happen now in a lot of different areas. Um, so in the earth sciences, ESIP have been um, pr uh, producing their own guidelines. In the arts and humanities in Europe, Claria have created software guidelines. Their guidelines for image processing, um, and um, for life sciences as well. Um, and in each of those cases, what it is is really a community effort to understand what people are willing to do, what people want to do, and what people find difficult to do. Uh, so in the example of Elixir, um, where we worked with um, a couple of other organizations to try and help um, create these guidelines, um, we had a number of different goals. So Principally, our aim was to um, define procedures to improve the quality and sustainability of software development within Elixir. Uh, but also we wanted to see whether this could be helpful for other people who were um, doing research in the life sciences. Um, the way we did this was for a series of workshops which used lightning talks to um, ensure that all the different participants had an idea of what they were trying to do in their research and how they developed software and also to bring about an understanding of where they were different and where they were similar. So where did their practices um, overlap um, and also where, where, where might there be um, things that set them apart. And one of the things we found very early on was that something that sets apart a lot of different groups is simply the size of the groups and the number of people that you can talk to to ask for help. So in some cases, people might be sitting within a large group of 30 or 40 um, research software engineers. In other cases, uh, there might be a single person um, uh, basically working virtually with a research group who are in another location. Um, and so through these workshops, what we did was try and agree practices. We built this community um, understanding created policy and then developed guidance. And you can see some of this policy and guidance um, in the outputs that have been linked here, which started off as some recommendations papers, but now include training courses building on this material um, and endorsement by the community as a whole. And again, one of the things that uh, I think is very important here is that this has been done in an open and um, democratic fashion. So it's been it's been facilitated by um, effort from Elixir, the Software Sustainability Institute and the Netherlands eScience Center, but anyone can contribute to this through the GitHub repo. Um, and I think here what we're really talking about is trying to create this overall research software workflow. 
where we are persuading people to um, really talk about working in collaborative ways, um, not only uh, at the end of the research workflow or at the start of it, but all through from developing code collaboratively using um, code repositories to sharing code through archival um, website, uh, sorry, archival repositories like Zenodo, um, um, all the way through to understanding how you might rerun or preserve and uh, make things citable. Um, and a very good example of this um, is the work that's been done for gravitational waves um, by LIGO, where they not only published a paper, uh, which is um, the kind of advertisement for what they've done, uh, but they provided a Jupyter notebook that allows people to see what they've done and play around with the data and the analyses uh, and effectively um, gain a sense of, of what the research is and how they did it. Um, and I think that's, that's the key to uh, making software better. Um, and that's about making it easier and useful for everyone. Because ultimately, if you're making it easier and useful for everyone, you're also making it easier and useful for you and your collaborators. So um, any questions at this stage? Yes, Neil. Um, I, yeah, two, two. Actually, uh, one of the questions here, I took the liberty of, uh, there, there, was, there were some comments here in the chat, and I took the liberty of, uh, you know, rephrasing the, the comment in terms of a question here. And I hope the participant doesn't mind. So concerning the reluctance of the, the, this is the question, or my question given the comment. Concerning the reluctance of developers or PIs in sharing their software, it could be related to putting professional reputation at risk or lack of funding. Sharing as a funding criteria might help. Would you comment on that, Neil? Um, I, that's a really good point to raise, and I think it's one which uh, I am very keen to see happen and have been advocating to the funders that I work with um, of how do we give incentives for sharing at the one place where um, where there is leverage from um, stakeholders, and that is the grant proposal. So what we've seen is um, certainly there's been this kind of um, stick approach, particularly around data sharing with data management plans, where we um, as uh, PIs on grant proposals are being um, told to provide uh, details of how we're sharing the data. But what I'd like to see happen is also the other side, which is to encourage incentives for sharing. Um, and for software particularly, I would like to see incentives for um, both the person who has a good track record in providing um, their software openly and sharing it. Um, and also for the uh, person who proposes to reuse software from someone else. Um, and perhaps that has to go both ways in as much as the, um, the, the uh, proposer should get an incentive and the person whose software that they're reusing gets an incentive. And obviously there are, there are issues around people gaming the system that need to be addressed um, and how this might work in practice. But I think that's the key to it, is um, creating incentives for people to share through uh, the funding um, frameworks. Um, I guess the last part on that is also um, to, to kind of understand that actually some of the preliminary research that is coming out has suggested that even without those additional incentives, um, there is a benefit to sharing software simply because it is likely to get you both more citations and more collaborators. Uh, and uh, one of the things that more collaborators give you is a better chance of getting those um, research proposals funded. So maybe by a slightly um, less direct route, there's, there's already an incentive for people to be sharing their code. Did you say there was a second question as well? Yeah, there is a second question here, Neil. So what about hiring software engineers and training them in the necessary science? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so um, that's a really good um, comment as well. And I think one of the things that I didn't put up was um, a slide which shows the sort of 
what I might call the spectrum of research software engineering. Uh, so I think it's important to understand that, again, uh, the research software engineer concept is not a one size fits all. It's not a single specific job description, but rather it's a continuum between um, the uh, right at one end, uh, what I, I would call the uh, researcher who develops a lot of software and uh, follows software engineering practices, but whose ultimate aim is not, um, I guess, entirely software related. Um, through to the software engineer that's been hired into a research project because they have skills in the particular technology and all the way in between. Um, one of the things that has become uh, popular as a term, although personally I, I dislike it, um, is this idea of res ops, um, where uh, for people who've, who've heard of the term DevOps, uh, I guess it's something it's similar where you have people who can provide um, experience and expertise across a stack of different things that might be required to support a research workflow um, and be able to deploy them very quickly. And you can see, um, for instance, at, at, um, in certain areas. So for instance, uh, in a lot of the areas which require you to be standing up um, things like uh, servers that allow you to do remote communication with uh, mobile or networks of sensors. You might have someone who's very skilled in understanding that particular uh, messaging technology. That might be someone who needs to know very little about the actual research, as long as they can talk to someone who understands the research requirements. Uh, so I think in many cases, there, uh, there are um, opportunities for hiring software engineers to do things and basically teaching them about uh, research um, or having them be uh, in contact with someone who can translate research requirements. I think the key thing for those people who are coming from software engineering more generally who want to make a career as research software engineers is that they've got to be interested in research. So they've got to be, they've got to be excited by scientific discovery um, because I think to be an effective research software engineer and to have a great career you have to be excited about what you're doing. Um, because um, although there are many research software engineers in industry as well, um, uh, so groups like Microsoft um, employ a lot, um, in general, most research software engineers are still employed in the, um, uh, in the kind of academic or research uh, laboratory sector where pay is not as good. So why are you doing it? You're doing it because you're interested in the research. Um, but I certainly think there are opportunities for, for us to be re-recruiting -recruit all of the graduates we've lost into industry um, into uh, more generic software engineering positions back into, into the uh, research community. Okay, shall I move on? Uh, actually, uh, let's see here, because there is a follow, uh, there's another question, a third question that came in related to the first mm -hmm. question. Would you like to answer it now or are we just... Uh... Okay. okay, let's do that. So, uh, do you believe that such code should be copyleft open source license to enforce sharing? Would that mm -hmm. be beneficial or harmful? Ah, that's a, that's a really uh, interesting question. So, what I'll give here is... Um, what I'll give here is a personal opinion um, because there have been some really good uh, blog posts in particular that have been written on both sides of the debate, whether things should be um, copy left or permissive. So um, my personal opinion is that I think permissive licenses are better. Um, simply because they provide more freedoms. Um, and whilst that provides freedom to exploit uh, commercially and potentially for, uh, for certain actors to take something and not give something back, I think the benefits of that outweigh the disadvantages because what you're doing is still allowing others to understand um, and, and reuse it in any way that they wish. There are also some potential benefits in areas where you are seeking to work with industry. So I've worked on a number of projects, um, research software projects directly with industry, and it is much easier to collaborate um, with industrial partners and gain funding from industrial partners 
if you are using permissive licenses. Um, in particular, uh, they are very wary of the AGPL and GPL licenses. Um, but having said that, I completely see also uh, the reasons why people might use the GPL license. Um, and uh, in, in some sense, that is very much more in the spirit of ensuring that people share. But I, I do think that in general, one of the problems we have around um, research in general is barriers um, to barriers to participation. And I feel that um, for good or bad, many people who do not have a good understanding of software licenses look at GPL um, with fear about how they might be able to engage with it. So, um, so I personally am someone who advocates for permissive licenses, but equally, I think there are no issues with using GPL licenses if you think that is the right license for your community. Um, I have an entirely separate talk around choosing licenses and, um, and how to understand what might be the right license. Um, and I'm happy to, to discuss with the person who asked that question um, their own particular views around licenses at a later date. Okay, so please uh, continue then. Okay, so um, just just to kind of like uh, start the sort of finishing off, um, um, I, I've said at the start that it's impossible to do this on your own and it's really all about communities and ensuring that we're able to communicate uh, why this is important to our peers. And one of the things that I found very useful in trying to understand how to do this more generally across a number of different areas is the concept of communities of practice. Um, so communities of practice have come out of a more general set of studies, um, again, I think in um, uh, really in economics, to uh, understand how we best share knowledge and information. And so they're defined as something where there are people who have a common um, set of knowledge uh, that they are trying to um, share ideas and foster interactions. Uh, and that the reason they're doing this is to improve the practice. Um, so it's all about a community that develops, shares and maintains a core of knowledge. Um, and what's great about the fact that this is coming from another area where they've um, done a lot of studies is that there's a lot of research into how you do this successfully. Um, and it's all sorts of things. Um, one of the things that um, I really um, strongly advocate for is this, the third bullet point, which is about welcoming and allowing different levels of participation. So there has to be a realization that the person who um, wants to become involved in your community may not have the same abilities, opportunities, um, or simply time to uh, participate how you would like them to. So being able to understand how you can offer opportunities for participation for all different levels of engagement is really important. The other thing that's really um, uh, nice about this work is this understanding that there is, there is this kind of public and private community space idea. So we often say that it's really important to do things in public and to make sure that everyone can see but actually, there are some things where you want to do things in private as well to resolve to resolve kind of um, uh, differences, perhaps before you you get together and um, publicly state what you've decided to perhaps understand how to um, how to kind of like engage with different groups in ways um, that you want to test ideas out first. Um, and I think the other thing here that really is important in, and uh, goes back to my answer around how you might encourage software engineers to, to stay in the community, I think it's generally how you get anyone to stay in the community, is combining familiarity and excitement. So it's got to feel like it's somewhere that you, you belong, and it's got to feel like you're still excited to be a part of it. And I think that's something that, that um, characterizes many successful communities of practice and is one of the key things and one of the hard things to really get right when we try and do this in our own um, areas. So some examples of successful COPs. Um, so we've uh, mentioned some of the ones on the um, right hand side, um, but uh, a couple of things that I wanted to really um, highlight. One of them is something called Hackier, which was 
piloted by the University of Melbourne. And what you see here are people just sitting down at a bench. Um, and the way that hackiars work out is um, they started off by a couple, couple of people basically setting up in a neutral space, in this case, um, a nice outdoor area outside a coffee shop. Um, I will note that this probably works better where you have a good climate for doing this. Um, I'm wanting to start up a hacky hour in Edinburgh in Scotland, and I'm not sure how I'm going to do this in the wintertime. Um, but uh, all it started off with was a couple of people saying, all right, let's take a change of scenery and let's for an hour um, during the middle of the day do our regular work in a different place, but also put up a sign that says, um, do you have questions? You know, ask them to us. Uh, and, that's, and that's expanded to a set of people who became curious, who started sitting down and, and doing things um, at, at, at lunch times as well. Um, and starting to ask questions. And then as more and more people um, joined in this, it turns out that the people um, who ask questions could work together with other people to try and solve the problem together. Or um, as it's expanded even more, you actually have the expert um, for your question uh, there alongside you. So um, it's a really good informal way of helping build up not just um, knowledge and sharing of knowledge, but a sense of community and camaraderie um, in a very simple way. Um, a similar thing there in the middle um, is something called our coding club, which has come out of geosciences. And it is um, something where a whole set of PhD students got together with one of their lecturers and said, we really don't think we're getting the, um, the skills we need to do the things you're asking us to do. Uh, how can we resolve this? And, and this is a sort of more formal way where they have worked out how to um, understand what skills they need and create a way of defining what the best way of teaching them um, to each other is. Um, and this is a combination of uh, lectures, of training, um, and of uh, that, that kind of like bottom slide, just kind of describing the work that they're doing to each other. So it sort of falls into this odd um, crossover between uh, a kind of like a, a PhD seminar hour uh, and a um, training session. Um, and I think what's really astounding about this is that this didn't have any support externally from the university. This really was just a whole set of people going up and saying, could we be doing better? And I think that's what the best examples of communities of practice do. It takes um, some people with the courage to say, can we do this better? Um, and, the, and then go on and do something about it. So um, I think uh, as I wrap things up, um, communities of practice are really great, but ultimately this is still going to be painful because so much of the research software world and research in general doesn't necessarily see the same viewpoint. And um, what we'd like to be able to do is all work together in our different areas to try and address the challenges that we see. So in summary, um, unsustainable code isn't intentional. Um, it's really about the tension between solving a task quickly um, versus solving it well and doing something for yourself versus doing it for others. The challenge is, as the question came up, that research does not incentivize good practice for software, even when the stakes are high, although there are some efforts to change this. Um, one example here that I'll mention is around efforts for software citation to make it easier to understand what software should be credited. And importantly, success has come in general from supporting the formation of communities of practice and sharing materials. Um, but this takes a lot of effort and goodwill. And I think my take home message from the webinar is for all of you um, who are listening to um, spread a little bit of your own effort and goodwill and encourage people to do this um, sharing of materials and practice um, wherever you are. So thank you very much. Thank you, Neil. Uh, there is a uh, actually uh, two questions here. Uh, so mm -hmm. the OK, so the first the first one here, um, I agree that educating our peers in sustainable practices is a vital need. 
Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for groups comprised of senior members who have domain expertise and junior members who have computer science training? Uh, okay. let, me, let me continue then with the, the other. By directional knowledge transfer across generational divides and through disciplinary ontologies is quite challenging. Have the service captured these cultural and disciplinary dynamics? Ah, interesting. So, so both of those questions are really um, getting at this perceived, um, perceived kind of like difference between. Uh, quite often, it's it's um, demonstrated as being a young versus the old, um, or a junior versus senior, or an um, established versus early career. Um, uh, and the second question actually takes a little bit further and sort of says between different domains. Um, so there are a few things that are really interesting in that. So some of the surveys that we've we've looked at um, and have been run um, in the in the UK, one of the things that's been interesting is uh, firstly um, the differences between domains in terms of the way that we use software and the expertise that is present within the, the population in general are actually very similar. So, for instance, we might think that uh, the practices in physics are substantially better and more commonplace than the practices in humanities. Actually, to, to a sort of an order of magnitude, that's not true. Um, there is software use in both. Um, there is a wide range of experience and expertise in both. Um, so one of the things that's, that's become clear is this is a problem for everyone. Uh, there certainly are challenges in transferring things from one discipline to another, um, whether that is standards, models, and ontologies at one level through to just uh, practice and experience at another level. Uh, but one of the things that we're finding um, is that as increasingly uh, the, the sort of work that we do in research is cross and interdisciplinary, this has to happen anyway. The thing that we find is the largest challenge, and this is something that I've experienced personally on some projects which have been interdisciplinary, is finding common language. Um, and that's literally understanding of terms. Um, I was on one project where one of the things they did to do this was uh, have a word of the week where someone suggested the word and people um, said what they thought their interpretations of this term was. And, and that just showed the different ways that people would have uh, uh, different perceptions would have of, of what the definition of a simple word like um, a grid was or a signal um, and so on. The other point which I think there is, there are many things that we can do about is around this idea of what happens when you're in a group where it's perceived that there are junior people who are um, computationally savvy and interested in changing the way that things are done, that, uh, but there are people further up who are more senior and resistant to change. Um, one thing is around understanding why people are resistant to change. Um, uh, typically, that's that's often because it's uh, it's the case that they think that because it worked for them, it should still work in the future. Um, and up to a point, that's true. But one of the things we see is that researchers, if practices and methods are evolving rapidly. Um, another is around the fear that this is just a waste of time, and why should we be investing effort in this particular thing rather than the next thing that you're going to be um, asking us to, to send you on courses for. And I think here the, the real um, leverage is around showing um, how many other people have benefited um, and showing what those benefits are. Because if there's one thing that tends to persuade um, senior people in my um, experience is the fear that they are losing ground on other similar groups. So introducing this little bit of competitiveness is, is quite useful. But I think lastly, it's understanding, um, understanding and being confident in the reasons behind why uh, you think these are good practices to instill in your lab or your group. Because um, one of the things you can do is you can point to other groups that have done this and shown success. Uh, but you can also point to your own success. You can put in a little bit of that effort and 
risk that goodwill to showing why um, the way that you're you're proposing to do it actually works. Um, and it is challenging, um, but ultimately, if if a number of different time, if you're doing a number of different things and none of them work, perhaps you might consider moving to a group that actually appreciates your skills and expertise and might make you succeed in your career. So that's that's sadly the, the sort of very end of that that kind of piece of advice. OK, thank you, Neil. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. So now uh, I'm going to actually share my screen. Uh, let's see here. Just to, to announce the next two we, uh, webinar in this series, uh, the webinar in September uh, on CMake and the one in October on configuration integration. I will be receiving uh, announcements about those. Uh, thank you very much again. Ashley would like to take over from now.